All right, everyone, welcome to lecture five. So this week, we're going to be focusing on multimedia. So before we get started, uh, just a quick note on the first exam. So congratulations to everyone on finishing the first exam. Uh, we'll get your scores back to you next week, just because uh, if you're taking the course at a distance, we just got all of your exams today. So we just want to make sure everyone gets them back all at the same time. Uh, so look forward to that uh, next week. So the last question on the exam, uh, as you all know, asked a question about my favorite meme. I thought it was actually pretty interesting uh, that we had a real world event in which my favorite meme made an appearance. So there's a conference down in Texas called South by Southwest. Uh, and they actually had Grumpy Cat making her first ever appearance. And some people actually on the exam wrote that Grumpy Cat was so grumpy because people are taking pictures of her all day and she doesn't really like that. Uh, and other people wrote Grumpy Cat so grumpy because she didn't have enough time on the exam. And that's, I'm sorry, Grumpy. So just the, the caption for this video is Grumpy Cat takes Grumpy to a new level, which I thought was great. So that's Grumpy Cat. So I figured since today is a lecture on multimedia that we could start off with a video. So let me pull this up. Too many computers today. Advertisement. All right, so this is from our favorite, The Onion. The internet is buzzing about the groundbreaking new YouTube contest calling for users to post a video that is good. Onion News Network Tech Trends reporter Jeff Tate has the story. Thanks, Nicole. YouTube presented the challenge at a press conference earlier today. Make a video that is actually worth watching. The prize? $100,000. The only requirement for our winning video is that it be somewhat watchable or provide even a shred of enjoyment for people other than those who made the video. Because the idea of making a good video is new to so many of its users, YouTube offered a list of suggestions including have some reason for making a video other than I own a camera. Make sure the subject of the video can be seen and shoot the video while sober. Hundreds of YouTube users have posted videos stating their intention to enter the contest, including Tamala Klebert of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Well, my dog farts is pretty funny. Maybe I'll just try to catch him doing that, but lots of sound effects. The contest also inspired John Malkin, who has already posted dozens of poorly lit, pointless videos on the site. I never thought of making a good video. It's hard enough to remember to shout directly into the camera without worrying about what to say. YouTube says the 10-person judging panel will be searching for a video that holds their attention, but not because it is so utterly mystifying they can't stop watching. When making their decision, judges will not consider ratings and comments from the public. We will not be affected by viewer consensus that the video is, quote, awesome LOL, the greatest ever, or for that matter, that it, quote, totally gay sucks, you suck, retarded fag. If and when a winning video is chosen, it will be placed in the new Actually Good tab on YouTube's website. For now, however, the section remains empty. There is a strong possibility that every entry will suck. Certainly, to this point, all information has pointed to that. For the Onion News Network, I'm Jeff Tate. YouTube says the contest has no deadline, a rule meant to encourage applicants to take the time to edit or revise their entry rather than simply uploading their video to the site without watching it. Moving on now, a new study is asking, are teens becoming desensitized to the violence they commit? So when that video was released, that last joke is probably funnier. <laughs> So what, what comes to mind when we talk about multimedia? So, so far we've talked about hardware, we've talked about the internet, but what, it, what is multimedia? What makes this, this area special? So we saw a kind of an example of this. We saw YouTube is kind of allowing people to create this multimedia, but what, what is multimedia? Either an example or what kind of separates it from what we've looked at so far.
Yeah, so music and movies, so kind of those types of files. So what else comes to mind when you think music, uh, multimedia? Photos. Yeah, photos, so that's another form. So this is kind of graphics and visual things. Anything else come to mind? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So often we have this combination. We have a movie with maybe some photos in it and some audio tracks. So lots of visual things or auditory things all coming together to create some something. So we're going to look at the three different types of multimedia today. We're going to start off with graphics, then we're going to move on to audio and sound, and then finally we'll take a look at video. So the first thing we should talk about, though, is different file formats. So, so far we've seen how we can use ASCII to write a text file. But what's kind of the problem, what's kind of the limitation with ASCII? Like what's something we cannot do with just using ASCII in a text file? Yeah, so we can't hear it, so that's one thing. So we can't kind of you know, embed any videos or anything like that. What are some other basic things that we just can't do with ASCII? Yeah. We can't customize icons. Yeah, exactly. We can't customize it. We can't change the font. We can't change the color. Right? ASCII is just kind of text. So let's say you did want to do something like that. You want to send someone a document, and you want to have you know, pink Comic Sans font, which I don't recommend. But let's say you want to do that. What would you do? Yes, so, we could, so that's a, yeah, so, so what is that? What is a vector file as compared to ASCII? What are, what are these two types of things? A uh, vector is more like, um, it's more like points on, uh, on text. Um, well, I should say, in terms of not vector, but vector is more like a, um, I guess, a really simple file, but I think it could be made into, into a shape, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Sure, yeah, so, so really then this is just a different way of representing that information. Right. Yeah, so I could also you know, open up Microsoft Word, for example. When I save a Microsoft Word file, I'm going to save something like a .doc file, right? So what is that doc? It's just a way of interpreting the bits of a file. So inside of that .doc, doc file, there's going to be some bits and some bytes and just a lot of stuff. And just looking at all that stuff, it's not really clear what you do with it. But what doc does is it standardizes how to interpret those bits. So that means that if I know how to interpret these bits, I can now read in and display a Word document that somebody sent to me. So the specification uh, for a Word document is 210 pages long. So if you're really interested in exactly what goes into a Word document, I guess you can read this. Uh, but beware, it's very technical. So it contains statements like, uh, chipixes are a gripple, not a chip. So this is an extremely, extremely technical document. But this is just to say that standards like DOC are really, really complicated, and a lot uh, went into them. But at the end of the day, this is really just some set of rules for interpreting the bits of a file. So just like before, we had protocols that established rules for communicating over TCP or HTTP. A file's format is simply a way to interpret the bits of a file. So let's take a look at a different file here. So over here. I have a text file. So inside of this text file, it's actually pretty boring. I just have a bunch of numbers. And how many numbers do I have? Roughly 187,000 of those numbers, just one per line. And so that means that this is just a text file, and we have these bits, and this collection of bits just represents some ASCII characters. Right? So this is kind of boring. So what would happen if I tried to open up this file in iTunes? What would happen? Yeah, exactly. So if iTunes has no idea what to do with all of these ASCII characters, right? If I open up Notepad or even Microsoft Word, those are programs that know how to interpret the bits of this file. So now what happens if I open up this file with something like Photoshop? What do you think will happen? So we have display the numbers. Any other guesses? If we open up this text file in Photoshop. So we have still so won't open. Maybe we'll get the same message as iTunes, unsupported file format or something like that. Any other guesses? OK, so let's do that. So I don't have Photoshop. So I'm going to use a free image editing program called the GIMP, uh, which you'll see later in the problem set. And I'm going to open this file. And this is what I got. So this file is called a PPM file, or pixel map. 
And what this is, is it's basically just a way of representing an image using ASCII. So that means that this file on disk is just a collection of bits, just a bunch of bits and bytes. And those are really meaningless until I know how to interpret them. So I could interpret them one way as ASCII characters. And if I interpret them as ASCII, then I get that big, boring text file. Or I could interpret them according to a different standard, this PPM standard, which tells us, well, these numbers actually represent an image. And so when I give this file to something that knows how to interpret this PPM file, I can actually get something that's entirely different, even though I promise you these are the same exact file. And you can feel free to try this uh, when you get home. So any questions on what we mean when we say file format? Yeah, so what do the numbers actually mean? So we'll actually see that really, uh, really soon. Um, but they're basically specifying the color for each of the pixels in this image. So does every picture have that? So th as we'll see, there's actually a bunch of different ways that we can represent image data. And this is just one of them. But a really common way to do that is to actually, yeah, define what does this pixel look like, what's the next pixel look like, and so on. And this is just one of many different ways to represent an image. And it turns out this is actually a pretty inefficient way to represent an image, even though we do get a nice shock cap. OK. So as we were just saying, a really common way to represent an image is this thing called raster graphics. And the process of rasterizing an image, or representing something using a raster graphics format, is we essentially make a big grid out of our image. So even if our image is a circle or a triangle, we're basically going to put a big grid around it. And so each of those grid, we, with this grid, we can define a bunch of small squares. And in doing so, we kind of divide this image up into little pixels. Where each pixel is just one small square inside of an image. And so really then, we have something that looks like this. So at the top left here, we have a really tiny image of a smiley face. But the way that we're defining what that smiley face looks like is we've created this grid of pixels. And each pixel has only one color in it. So we've blown this up really largely. And you can kind of see the actual pixels of the image, especially down here, for example. You can kind of see the squares that are making up the curve of the smiley face. And so each of these pixels now has one color associated with it. But now if we kind of shrink this down, you can no longer see those individual squares. You kind of get something that looks more reasonable, uh, like an image. So now, how do we define the color for each of these pixels? Does anyone happen to know? The kind of the bottom diagram gives you a little hint. How do we, how do we say this pixel is yellow? Anyone? Yeah, so exactly. So we say that we're going to get yellow by mixing together these three primary colors. So back in grade school, you know, we, I, was, I really loved arts, art class. We had all this paint. You got to mix the paints together. And I thought it was super cool when you had red paint and blue paint mixed together, and you get purple paint. So this is kind of the same exact thing here. Rather than red, just red and blue, we have these three primary colors. And from these three primary colors, if we mix different combinations of them, we can actually get any color that we want. So here you can see that we can get colors like yellow or brown or gray just by mixing different amounts of this red, green, and blue. So let's talk about how that actually works. So when we take these, we kind of start from nothing. and we start mixing colors together, this is called additive color mixing, because you're taking colors and you're adding them together. So rather than think about paint, let's actually think about different colors of light. Since your computer's display is basically just a bunch of small little lights that has a red light, a green light, and a blue light, when each of them turn on, the colors are going to add together something like this. So imagine you're in a dark room, and you're looking at kind of a, a black wall. If you turn on a red light all the way up, and you shine it at the wall, what color do you get? Dark room, turn on a red light, what color is the light? Yeah, so it's just red. OK, so now according to this, let's say you then turn on a green light, and you point it at the same exact spot on the wall. What happens? Yeah, so kind of like this diagram here. So what, what happens when the red and the green kind of overlap? Yeah, so we get a yellow color. So that's kind of in the top here. 
So here we get a yellow. So this is just only where red and green are mixing. We get a purple only where red and blue are mixing. And we get kind of a lighter blue over here where just the green and the blue are mixing. So what happens if we turn all of the lights all the way up? What color do we get? White. Yeah, so we're going to get white. So white then is kind of the combination of all three of these primary colors. And so we happen to choose red, green, and blue as our primary colors. And so we'll call this RGB. So we're going to start expressing colors in terms of how much red do we have, how much green do we have, and how much blue do we have. But we looked at that image before, and we said it's 90% red. Well, 90% of what? Right? So we actually need to define some values associated with the red, the green, and the blue. And we call these values the color depth of an image. So let's say um, that I had a color depth of 1. So that means that each of those values could either be 0% red or 1% red. So that would be a color depth of 1. That means how many bits am I using for each of those, for each of red, green, and blue? If it can be either 0 or 1, how many bits do I need? Yeah, so just one bit. So let's say then I use more bits. Let's say I use 8 bits. So that means that, the va that means that each of those channels, red, green, and blue, can be represented with 8 bits. So that means that what values can I use for red, green, and blue? What's the range that those can take on? Yeah, so 0 to 2 to the 8, right? Because that's kind of the, the largest number that I can represent with 8 bits. So more technically, we're going to be 2 to the 8 minus 1, which is going to be 255. So that means that if I have 8 bits for red, 8 bits for green, 8 bits for blue, what's my color depth? How many bits is each pixel? So 8 for, each, eight for 3 colors, so how many total? Yeah, so we're just going to be 24. So we have 8 bits for red, plus another 8 bits for green, plus another 8 bits for blue, means that we have a color depth of 24 bits. So what happens as I increase my color depth? What does that allow me to do? Yeah, exactly. So that means we have more choices. right? If I only have two bits, that means I can have you know, either 0 red, 1 red, 2 red, or 3 red. But if I have 255 bits, suddenly I can be a lot more precise with what I mean when I say 60% red. So the color depth then tells us what colors I can actually represent inside of my image. So to actually express these values, as we said, we're going to give some values for each of these three channels, red, green, and blue. But we're frequently going to represent this with something like this. So this is hexadecimal notation. So we've seen binary so far. We've seen octal. Hexadecimal is just rather than being base 2 or base 8, this is just base 16. So that means each of these slots is 16 to the 0, 16 to the 1, and so on. And all that does, it conveniently allows us to represent those 8 bits with just two slots. So if this means, if my largest hexadecimal de decimal digit is an F, because we, we're using base 16, so that means after 9, we need to go to A, B, C, D, E, and F. So this is defining how much red I have, how much green I have, and how much blue I have. So what color is this? So if the first slot is how much red, so it looks like I'm going to have two digits per each of these channels. So how much red do I have, a lot or a little? Yeah, so we have a lot of red. So that means FF is basically as high as we can go. So we can't have any more red, because FF is the highest number we can make with just two, two hexadecimal digits. OK, so we have a lot of red. How much green do we have? None. And how much blue do we have? None. So what color is this? Exactly. So this is pure red. So let's try another one. So the first thing, how much red do we have? None. How much green? A little bit. How much blue? A lot. So what color is this? So we're, what two colors are we mixing together? Green and blue. So what do we get? 
Yeah, so we just get kind of a lighter blue. So purple would be red and blue, and it's super easy to forget what happens until you get actual paint, which is fun. Uh, so this, then, is a representation of kind of a sky blue or a lighter blue. So any questions on how we're representing the values of these colors? Yeah? Um, when you say a lighter blue, now, which, both of which things, like what kind of those are the majority of the sky blue? Like, do they just use the majority of those? That's, that's what I'm kind of confused. Oh, sure. So uh, the actual reason blue and green mixes to be like sky blue, that I'm not sure of. But this just, when you mix, when you mix this much blue with this much green, you get a color that's kind of a, a cyan or a sky bluish. The actual theory behind that, I'm not too sure of. So uh, as computer scientists, we, of course, went totally overboard. And we picked a bunch of hexadecimal combinations, and we gave them names. So if I flip back over here. So here we go. This is htmlcolornames.com. And if we scroll down, they kind of get uh, progressively more ridiculous. So we get colors like papaya whip and peach puff. There's also a blanched almond and a linen. And so these are actual, just really specific names for colors. But behind each of these colors, so let's choose Peach Puff, we can see that this is just an HTML hexadecimal character code. We have a lot of red, we got, even, we got a little less green and a little less blue, and that's how we get Peach Puff. So these are the actual technical names for these colors, in case you ever need to be specific. So that's additive color mixing. But if you've ever refilled the ink cartridges on your printer, you probably didn't have red, green, and blue ink. What color ink did you have? Yeah, so we have this CMYK, the cyan, magenta, yellow, and K for black, or key. And so this works a little bit differently than additive color mixing. So when we figured out how additive color mixing works, we put ourselves in a really dark room, and we turned some lights on. Now, if I print something and put it on a piece of paper, that's kind of not at all what's going to happen, right? Instead, I'm going to have some sunlight or some you know, indoor lights that is something white, and it's going to hit the paper. So we kind of have these two different situations. One, we're kind of turning lights on, and we're adding colors together. And another one, we're starting off, well, we're beginning <laughs> with all of the lights on, and we're looking at what happens when some white light hits some other colors. So what's going to happen is something like this. So over here on the left, we have some white light. And just a few minutes ago, we decided that that white light was just a combination of blue, red, and green. So now, when this white light hits a surface that is cyan, for example, so cyan is just this light blue here, what's going to happen is this light blue is going to absorb all of the red light. So that means that once it hits this color, the only two colors left are this blue and this green. And it just so happens that blue and green make cyan. And so that means that when I put this cyan ink on the paper, kind of logically, we're going to get the color cyan. But we're not really adding colors together anymore. We're kind of starting off with some white light, and we're subtracting some colors away. So now let's, let's try mixing some colors. So again, we have some white light over here on the left. So that's just red, green, and blue. So now when it hits a yellow this time, it just so happens that when this light hits the yellow, all of the blue is going to be absorbed this time. So that means that I'm just left with some red and some green. And then if I put my cyan back in, well, it's going to do the same thing it did last time. It's going to absorb all of the red. So that means that when I mix yellow and cyan and then look at it with white light, I'm going to see green which makes sense. So as you said before, this is called CMYK. And this is just a different color model. This is a different way of combining things to get color. So typically, we're going to use RGB when we're looking at you know, displays or things with light, and we're combining together light. But once we start printing things and putting them on paper, we're going to use the CMYK. And really, this is just kind of abstract and different ways of representing colors. But when you're at the printer store looking for an ink cartridge, this is what that's referring to, just the different colors of the ink that we can combine together to get any color we want. So by the way, we just saw that with C, M, and Y, we can get any color. So that means that if we combine uh, cyan, magenta, and yellow, 
we should absorb all of the colors in the white light. And so what should that do? What color do I get when I mix all three of these? Black. We get black. So then why do we have this K? If all we need are these three letters to get anything, including black. Yeah, so really practical reason, right? So if you, it's really common that we print black. That's kind of the most common thing that comes out of your printer. So it would be kind of silly to every time you wanted to print a black document to use up all of your cyan, magenta, and yellow ink. So instead, we just kind of tacked on this black since that's kind of a really common use case. So another reason is that you know, this, this all works well in theory, um, but in practice, you know, it's going to take a lot of ink to get the, black, the, the true black that you're looking for. So again, it's just going to be a real waste to go through and you know, blow all your color ink on a, what, a black and white document. So that's where the K in CMYK comes from. Uh, it's not CMYB for some reason, because B was blue, I guess. So that shows K uh, for key. OK, so any questions on how we're going to start mixing things together and representing color in images? OK, so let's start talking about one format for representing an image. So we saw before that we're going to be talking about raster graphics. And that just means that we're going to take an image, we're going to slap a grid on it, and each of those squares in the grid is going to have a color. And this is the basis for a format called a bitmap. And the bitmap is really, really similar to the PPM that we just looked at. But a bitmap, the basic idea is it's going to be a big collection of bytes, all just one next to each other. And each byte is going to describe the color of a pixel in the image. So a bitmap starts off with this thing called a magic number. And the magic number for a bitmap is just these, this sequence of bytes, 42, 4D, which happens to be the hexadecimal representation of the number 66 followed by the number 77. They don't happen to remember what the ASCII value of 66 is. So this is kind of random. Uh, but 66 is a capital B. So for D then, or 77, is just a capital M. So that means that all we're saying with this magic number thing is that every bitmap is going to start off with these bytes that are BM. So does that mean that every time I have a file and I see BM at the very beginning, does that mean I have a bitmap? So I get a random file. It starts with 66, 77. Can I say, yep, definitely a bitmap, so it has the bitmap magic number? Yes. So yes? So, any, so who votes yes? So anyone, who votes no? All right, so we're like 10% voted. <laughs> OK, so let's, let's go back. So let's say I create a file. I'm going to open up uh, text edit. I'm just create a plain old text file. I'm going to make the text really big. What are the bytes of this file? This is just plain old ASCII text, and I'm just zooming in. What are the bytes of this text file? Yeah, so the first byte is B, the second byte is M. So that means that this has, starts off with the magic number for a bitmap. But this isn't necessarily a bitmap. So this magic number doesn't mean that I'm looking at a bitmap. So we can say that every bitmap starts with this magic number, but not every file that starts with this magic number is a bitmap. So the purpose of this thing is just to kind of you know, provide some indicator to another program that, hey, uh, here comes a bitmap. And why did we decide to do that? Well, the bitmap file format told us to. So end of story there. So I hit the wrong button. So that's our magic number. So that means that's the first thing in every single bitmap file. And that's something the format tells me to do. So up next, we have this thing called metadata. So has anyone heard this word before? What is metadata? Whether it be, what is it? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's meta. It's, it's, some more, it's some data about the file's data. So what, be, what might be some metadata that we're associating with a bitmap? Yeah, so size. What else? Yeah, so there could be some, you know, maybe some additional information like a comment or something. But what, what's something really basic about the file? What do we need to know? 
So how about the file size? Right? I think I heard that. So we're saying not, not just the size, but the actual width and the height. Right? So it's not enough to just say that there's 100 pixels in this image. We need to know, well, is it like 50 by 2? Is it 25 by 4? I'm actually really impressed that I just did that right, I hope. So we're just, we need to say, OK, Photoshop, or OK, GIMP, this is how big the file should be across. This is how big the file should be down. And so that's just some of the things that we're going to include in the bitmaps metadata. So again, without this metadata, we really have no idea what to do with this collection of bits. Because we don't know, do we just display them across? Do we do anything else? So this tells the application what to do with these pixels. So after that, after the magic number followed by the metadata, now we have the actual data of the file. So that means that we're going to start defining colors for each pixel. So here's a really simple bitmap image. We can see here really clearly each of the pixels in the image. So here, for example, this is just one pixel. So that means we're using 24 bits to represent, for example, his left eye or the corner of his mouth here. So let's actually take a look at the individual bits inside of this file. So I'm going to use a special program here called XXD. And all XXD does is it just goes through the bytes of a file and displays them. So again, I'm not interested in kind of making red pixels anymore. I want to look at the actual bytes of the file. So here is what the actual bytes of the file looks like. So kind of ignore everything to the left and the right. But here we can see that each of these pixels here is grouped as exactly six hexadecimal digits. So we can kind of see the outline of a smiley face, right? So we can kind of see, well, this, we have two types of pixels, FFFFF, that's all white. So that means that this thing must be, what? This thing here must be red. But what's kind of weird about this? Yeah, so this is, this is actually backwards. So bitmap just happens to say, you know, we're still going to use RGB. All of that is still going to be the same. But I'm going to be difficult and just store it backwards for you. Some other bitmaps are actually really difficult, and they store the image upside down, because that's what they decided to do. So somewhere inside of the metadata or somewhere in the file, we need to say, hey, by the way, this is upside down. Sorry. So this one isn't. So we can see here that we can kind of see a bit of a smiley face here, where we're defining what the color of each pixel is. So by the way, when I, when I ran this magic incantation, all I'm saying up here is I want you to say, I want you to group everything into kind of three channels each, and I want the whole thing to be 24 bits. And this thing here has just said, I want you to skip over 54 bytes. So what did I just skip over? So what did we say is at the beginning of the file? Yeah, so we had some metadata, and we had that magic number. So let's say we, we don't skip it. Let's just get rid of this. If we don't skip it, then we see here the first bytes of the file, 42, 4D. Just as we expected, there's our magic number. And the reason I skipped is just because kind of this additional info at the beginning makes it look a lot less like a smiley face. So any questions on exactly what this is representing? Yeah. Yeah, so this XXD thing, this will work for any type of file. So this is saying, I don't really care how I'm supposed to interpret these bytes. I'm just going to tell you what those bytes are. So Photoshop, on the other hand, would say, OK, I know I have an image. I kind of want to take this byte and make it red and you know, do whatever. XXD says, I have no idea what this file is. I don't really care. I'm just going to tell you what the bytes are. So this will work on kind of any file that you give it. If you want to find out exactly what's contained within a file, and kind of express it just using this nice hexadecimal notation. Other questions on how this, on why this is a bitmap? Okay. So now let's talk about resolution. Can anyone describe what the resolution of an image is? What is that? What is the resolution of an image described? Sure. So, what you, so a little more precise, by percentage, we're kind of saying, you know, how big are each of these squares inside of my image? So, kind of, what you could say, you know, what percentage of the total image is each of these squares? 
So when I have a low resolution image, that means that each of these squares is really, really big. So over to the left here, we have a low resolution logo. You can kind of see that, you know, it's it, kind of hard to see in the projector, but it's kind of lame. You can, it's really pixelated, it's not smooth, it's just the quality is really, really low. But the reason that's happening is because we're only saying we have 16 pixels across and 16 pixels down to work with. So on the other hand, over on the right here, we have another image, and it's the same exact width and the height. The only thing we've changed is the size of each one of those small squares inside of the grid. So now that we have 512 little pixels to work with, we can create a lot more detail. Right? And so that means that we can make this file larger, and it just kind of looks a much higher quality. Because these dots are smaller, we can create you know, these nice looking curves and gradients and things like that. So resolution then kind of describes how much information we can actually encode in one of these files. So if we flip back over here. So a really common thing um, that you'll see on a lot of things like CSI or crime shows. And someone will, will be looking at it, a video from the crime scene. Let's say, oh wait, I, I think I see something in a reflection, or I want to see the license plate. I want you to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and enhance the image. And so now we can kind of see that this makes no sense, right? So we can only zoom in so far because each image has to have a resolution associated with it. So even if that resolution is really, really high, there's going to be a point where you can't zoom in anymore because you kind of hit one of those individual squares on the grid. So what we're about to see is, is actually a nice compilation um, from a variety of, of crime scene TV shows and movies uh, that make no sense. Okay. Now let's get a good look at you. Oh, and, and by the way, I'm sure that you know that the writers for these kind of think they're super original and like, oh my god, I'm the first person to do this. Like, look how climactic this is. Uh, and so it's really interesting that it's not. Hold it. Run that back. Wait a minute. Go right. There, freeze that. Full screen. Okay, freeze that. Tighten up on that thing. Vector in on that guy by the back of you. Zoom in right here on the spot. With the right equipment, the image could be enlarged and sharpened. What's that? What's an enhancement program? Can you clear that up any? I don't know. Let's enhance it. Enhance section A6. I enhance the detail and... I think there's to enhance release it to my screen. Enhance the reflection in your eye. Let's run this through video enhancement. Edgar, can you enhance this? Hang on. I've been working on this reflection. There's someone's reflection. A reflection. There's a reflection of the man's face. A reflection. There's a reflection. Zoom in on the mirror. You can see a reflection. Can you enhance the image from here? Can you enhance it right here? Can you enhance it? Can you enhance it? Can we enhance this? Can you enhance it? Hold on a second, I'll enhance it. Zoom in on the door. Times tap. Zoom. Move in. More. Wait, stop. Stop. Pause it. Rotate a 75 degrees around the vertical, please. Stop. Go back to the part about the door again. Got an image enhancer that can fit that? Maybe we can use the Predeep Send method to see into the windows. This software is state of the art. The eigenvalue is off. With the right combination of algorithms. He's taken elimination algorithms to the next level, and I can use them to enhance this photograph. Lock on and enlarge the Z axis. Enhance. 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 Freeze and enhance. So sorry for just ruining all of those movies. Um, we can see kind of at the end there, uh, people were just kind of using words that didn't make any sense at all. And so really then, if, if someone were to zoom in on the reflection, they'd see something that looks a lot more like this logo on the left, in which case it's really impressive that they can still read the license plate, uh, not this thing all the way over to the right that they're claiming. Yeah? Sure. Not to the quality that they're claiming you could do. So there's, you know, we can only zoom in to a point. It's not like we can take this 2D image and then suddenly like rotate and get a 3D world or, or see someone's reflection. So there's, there's just no way that you can actually achieve the quality that they're saying you can. And also, too, like some of the shows, like MacGyver, for instance, they look at the window. And then some of the shows, they have to do zoom in again and just to create like a sense and convey a little bit better video. Yeah, so you know, in, in Photoshop, there's like effects like sharpen, but you know, all that's really doing is kind of making lines a little straighter. You're not actually going to you know, increase the detail.
Yeah. Um, my question is, um, when they zoom in, um, how can they see anything when it's just like a blob? Yeah, so they, yeah, yeah. yeah right, so they can't. Yeah, so they're going to zoom in, they're going to see a blob, and then they run yeah, this. So I see a blob even in those shows. I'm like, what are they looking at? I don't see it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the original, you know, the original video camera is going to have a resolution. And if you start off at a low resolution and then try to blow it up, then you're going to kind of run into trouble really fast. You know, but then if you have a larger resolution, you know, I, I could probably get away with taking this Vimeo logo over on the right, and I could make it a little bigger, and you might not notice any loss in quality. Whereas over here on the left, I started off with kind of a low resolution camera or video camera. If I blow it up even more, then I'm going to run into trouble really fast. So yeah, it's definitely true. Um, that different video cameras will have different resolutions, and that'll give you different levels of detail. Yeah? I just have a question. Um, is the area that is like depicted in this the river that the Zoom guys stay at? Uh, like, uh, yeah, so, so the area that these pixels are distributed over? Yeah. So basically just making a grid where everything is of equal size. Okay. So we're saying, we're just kind of saying how many across do we have and how many down do we have? Yeah, so this one over here on the left, you know, if, if this, this image has to have been enlarged, right? Or else, you know, the 16 by 16 would just be this little tiny little thing. So when we enlarged it, we kind of ended up creating this effect that looked like there are more pixels. But yeah, but this is just kind of an example of a, a low number versus a high number. OK, so, so that's resolution. But does anyone notice any problems with the bitmap format? Is there anything that's kind of inefficient about it? Yeah, so we're going to get a lot of data, right? So let's consider this bitmap. So the bitmap for this flag is going to say something like black, 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 black. It's going to keep going until we've hit all of the pixels in the first row of this image. Then we're going to get the second row of black pixels. We're going to get the third row of black pixels. And we're just going to keep storing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And so that means that's really, really inefficient, right? I mean, when we're adding numbers together, we could say something like 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, or we could just say oh, 2 times 5. And this is kind of a big improvement we can make now on the bitmap format. And this type of compression is called lossless compression. And that means that we're taking some bitmap that has some data in it, and we're simply changing how we're representing that data, but we're not going to lose anything. Right? When we say 2 times 5, it's the same exact way of expressing 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2. And we haven't lost any information. We've just come up with a more compact representation of it. So here, with this, with this image here, we can actually say, all right, if I, if I hit a black pixel and then there's a black pixel next to it, I can say, well, rather than storing them twice, say there are two black pixels. And if there's a third, I can say there are three black pixels, and so on and so forth. And so one format that uses this type of compression is called GIF. By the way, you might also have heard this pronounced GIF. Uh, this is an internet holy war, how you pronounce GIF, if it's GIF or JIF. Uh, word on the street is that the original developers wanted it to be pronounced like the peanut butter, because they said, like, choosy developers choose JIF. And they weren't that funny. But <laughs> I think, so I, I am on the side of the holy war, war that says JIF. Um, but according to both the American and Oxford dictionaries, GIF is also OK. Uh, so if anyone corrects you, you can tell them that. So this is just one form of compression. And we're going to take this bitmap, and we're going to store it way more efficiently. right? But what happens if we throw this one at it? Are we going to do the same, better, worse than the previous one? So which of these files is going to be larger? Or, if, or are they the same? Is anyone going to compress better than the other one? Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's a really good idea. Maybe we could, so why do you want to rotate it though? Yeah, exactly. So if we just take the, the format we just came up with, just kind of repeated pixels across horizontally, then ex exactly what you described, we're going to run into an issue because we need to pause for white and kind of restart for red. And so just using that compression algorithm or pr technique for compressing, we're going to get a much larger file. So it would be a really good idea to just kind of rotate this, compress it, and rotate it back. But unfortunately, that's just not something GIF has you know, allowed you to do in their compression. And so exactly, that exactly means that this will be a larger file because we can't kind of use that little trick that we came up with, even though it's an awesome idea and other formats maybe could do something like that. But because we've just chosen this kind of arbitrary way of compressing a file, it is going to be the case that some files will just compress better than other ones. But in both cases, we haven't actually lost any data. We're preserving all of the original data inside of our bitmap. So we just saw that you know, that might be kind of limited. Right? If maybe preserving all this data isn't that good of an idea, because we're going to end up still with these really, really big files. So instead of lossless compression, where we are not losing any data, let's try lossy compression, which means that we are going to throw away some data, but we're going to throw away parts where you can kind of still tell what's going on. So here's an example of lossy compression. So can everyone kind of read what this says? Yeah, so hey, what are you doing tomorrow? I wanted to go see Ben. And so this is, this is a pretty readable message. You know, you can still kind of interpret what's going on. But the original message, obviously, looks something like this. And we had commas, we had vowels, we didn't have digits. But we've conveyed the same exact information with this compressed version where we threw away some data than as this original version. And the reason we did that is we were just smart about the data we threw away. Right? We didn't throw away the whole word Ben. We, you know, we just, we, let's say we took out the vowels in tomorrow. Because you know, there aren't very many words in the English language that look like that. We can just figure out that that word means tomorrow. And so this is the basic idea behind lossy compression. We're going to throw away some data that you aren't really going to miss if we throw it away. So one image format that uses lossy compression is called JPEG. So you've probably seen JPEG uh, if you've used digital cameras, since they're really common for that. And the basic idea here is that rather than representing every single pixel or even a lossless representation of every single pixel, we're literally just going to throw some away. And hopefully you're not going to notice. So here we have the same image, and it's using different levels of compression. So on the left here, we have a compression factor of 10. And on the right, we have a compression factor of 50. So that means we're throwing away a ton of pixels. But it's still pretty clear what this image is. So even though we've really, really cut this thing down to size, you can still very easily tell what the image is. Like the, compared to the left, you know, the right one is a little more distorted, and it's a little pixelated and lower quality. Uh, and you can't see it as much on the projector here as you will when you look at it on your computer screens. Uh, but it's still pretty obvious what's going on here. And the reason this works is because digital photos typically have tons of pixels. Right? If, you have a digital, if you have a digital camera on your smartphone, and it's something like 3 megapixels or 5 megapixels, that means that each one of these individual images is 3 or 5 million pixels. So if I throw one of them away, you're probably not going to notice. And if I throw a lot of them away, if I'm smart about how I do it, then you're probably not going to notice either. So of course, lossy compression doesn't always work. So let's say I have this image here. Let's, let's just say that each of these pixels is the same size as this white one in the middle here. So really, if we threw any of these away, we're, we're going to kind of run into some problems. It's not going to be a box anymore as soon as I throw away any one of those green pixels. So here, lossy compression might not be the best idea in the world. right? We can't really throw away or combine or do anything like that. And this is just to say um, that that's why lossy compression is used on JPEGs, just because it's, it's a different use case. right? JPEGs are typically digital photos, uh, where GIFs are typically smaller images that aren't uh, as detailed as a digital photo. So any questions on compression? OK. So one other thing um, that is really helpful for images to support is this thing called alpha. So what is alpha in an image? Any guesses? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so kind of like quality. So you can actually, we can probably produce what might be perceived as higher quality images with this. So alpha refers to transparency. So when we had bitmaps, our choices were anything between white and black, kind of all of the ranges between 0, 0, 0, 0, FFFF. What a transparency allows us to do is kind of adds on an additional channel. So rather than just RGB, we start having RGBA. So that means we can have images with transparent backgrounds. So that means if we have a red web page, we put the image on the red web page, then suddenly that image has a red background. So alpha is something that JPEGs do not support. Uh, GIFs do support it, which means that you can have you know, transparency in a GIF. And there's also another common image format that supports it called ping. And ping has been really popular, or PNG. I don't know if it's actually ping. I always say ping. And it's really popular on the internet today because it's kind of a nice balance between all the formats we've looked at so far. It has really nice color depth. It supports transparency. Uh, it compresses nicely. And the PNG acronym, uh, rumor has it that even though it officially stands for Portable Network Graphics, uh, that it actually stands for ping is not GIF, uh, because the people who develop ping uh, were a little upset about GIF's licensing terms. And so they wanted to create something that you know, was just as good, um, but much nicer. Uh, but what nothing else can do, uh, or any of these other formats can do, is have animation inside them. And when you're really bored on a Monday morning, that is something that you really want. So animated GIFs, you may have seen on the internet, look something like this. So this is perhaps how you felt this morning. A cat going down the stairs with his head. And so the way this works is we're basically taking some individual GIF images and we're just combining them. So each of those images is kind of a frame inside of this animation. Now when I display this GIF, we're just going to show one frame for a little while, then move on to the next one. And so we get something that looks like this. Another really famous animated GIF is one that I could watch literally all day. There's just something mesmerizing about how accurate it is. So unfortunately, you know, when we have JPEGs or bitmaps, we don't have the capability to keep replaying this animation over and over again. So if you're really bored, a uh, really good source for animated GIFs that are reactions to situations you might occur every day, every day uh, what should we call me? Uh, we won't go there right now in the interest of time. Uh, but if you don't feel like listening to me, I highly recommend that's where you go. So here's just a summary of the different image formats we've looked at so far. So feel free to refer to this. So bitmaps we saw are not compressed at all. GIFs and pings have this lossless compression, where JPEG uses lossy compression. We have different color depth, different supported color depth in all of these images. So GIF, because it's only 8 bits, means that we, you know, we can't represent uh, the same depth of color, the same range of color that we could represent the digital photo. And so that's why if you take a really nice digital photo, you probably don't want to save it as a GIF. And finally, uh, the transparency channel, self-explanatory. So let's take a five minute break, uh, and then we'll come back and look at some different image formats and then move on to sound and video. All right, so welcome back. So we just saw how we could use raster graphics to represent images by kind of defining a grid of pixels and saying what color that pixel is. But we kind of quickly ran into this problem of, well, once we have this one resolution, we can't really scale it up. So now let's take a look at vector graphics, which are basically a different way of representing images that kind of came up a little bit earlier. And what this is going to allow us to do is kind of scale up as much as we want. So the basic idea behind vector graphics is that we're going to use the magic of math to represent images. So we see here, you know, we have some shapes like a circle and some lines. So rather than remembering, OK, this pixel here should be black, this pixel here should be gray, we're actually going to define equations for each of these shapes and lines and curves. So for example, up here we have something like a circle. So remember that the equation for a circle is something like x squared plus y squared equals some number. That's the radius of the circle. So that means that if we you know, pick a radius for the circle, that we're going to be able to create as big a circle as we could ever possibly imagine, right? because we're not limited by any single resolution. So same thing here. If we just define these mathematical equations for each of these shapes, then we can kind of plug in whatever values we want into those equations. So we're just going to get kind of progressively bigger and bigger numbers, which means that we can get bigger images without losing any quality. So these are really commonly on Wikipedia as SVG files, or scalable vector graphics. And you can see here down the bottom, we can take this vector graphic and we can convert it into a raster graphics format like ping. 
And here it just gives us a bunch of different options for sizes. And we're not going to have any quality loss now. Because all we're going to do is we're going to say, I want an image that's 2,000 pixels large. I have a bunch of equations describing stuff. I'm just going to plug in 2,000 into some of those equations, and I'm going to get a really big image. And you can see here that in this really big image, I don't have you know, this pixelation with the squares or anything, even though this is much bigger than the original image was that we were just looking at. And so this is just one advantage of vector graphics. It's just a different way of representing images. But now, you know, we don't create this grid of pixels. We just use math and create equations for each of the shapes. So one downside of vector graphics is it might not be easy to come up with an equation for a grumpy cat. Right? That's kind of a really complex shape. And it might not give us the same picture as our original raster graphics image. So uh, pros and cons of vector graphics. Um, but the big advantage here is that we can kind of scale this to be whatever we want and we're not going to get any loss in quality because we're just plugging numbers into equations. And it's no harder to plug in 100 than it is to plug in a million to those equations. Make sense? So we won't go into any of the math or anything. Question? Yeah, so uh, you saw the metrics, right? Like, do you convert these other costs like uh, raster graphics to raster graphics? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can we convert uh, back and forth? So we saw here, what we just did was we converted a vector to a raster. And that was really, really easy. All we did was we plugged in some numbers to the equations. Going the other way around, though, is more difficult. Because that's when we ha actually have to come up with these equations that kind of match the same shape. So it's easy to go from vector to raster, but it's a little harder to go the other way around. Because you kind of have to fit everything exactly with math. Question? OK, so let's switch gears a little bit from graphics and start talking about audio. So the first thing we want to go over is what sound actually is and how we represent sound in the real world. So from high school physics, we remember that sound is basically a wave. And this wave is just a bunch of oscillating pressure changes. Eventually, the pressure changes reaches your ear, it vibrates something in your ear, and you get some sound. So if sound looks like a wave like this, what are the two kind of knobs we can turn to get a different wave. So they're labeled. What are they? Yeah, so frequency and amplitude. So what, is, what do each of those mean? Yeah, exactly. So frequency is kind of the distance. Let's say the distance between you know, this thing here, this peak, and this peak here. So that's kind of one wavelength. And so frequency just says, how many wavelengths can we fit into some you know, amount of time, like a second or so. And then what's amp uh, amplitude? Yeah, exactly. So amplitude, then, is basically the distance from this 0 here to the top of this peak or the bottom of this valley. So in terms of when you're perceiving sound, what is amplitude? What does that kind of correspond to? Yeah, so amplitude is loudness. So a bigger amplitude means a louder sound. You have kind of a, a taller wave. So what is frequency? Yeah, frequency is pitch. So that means that if we have a higher frequency, you get a higher pitch, like my voice. So what happens now if two waves hit one another? So as we're sitting here, uh, there's you know, a whole bunch of sounds going on. You know, RJ's not paying attention. He's typing on his laptop. I'm talking. So now these two sound waves are going to interact because they're in the same space. So what happens? is we get something called interference. So waves can interfere in basically two ways. If these waves are in phase, so kind of these peaks line up, then when they hit each other, they're going to get louder. The amplitude of the result is just going to go up. If they're out of phase, meaning the every peak lines up with the valley, then we're going to get cancellation. So then we're going to get this straight line, and it's going to result in no noise. So if you have noise-canceling headphones, by the way, this is kind of how they work. You know, they're going to try to produce waves that will cancel out any waves coming into your ear. So then if we have something kind of in the middle, then we're going to get kind of something that looks like this. Some parts are going to get louder. Some parts are going to get quieter. So even though you know, we're just sitting here and there's you know, one big sound, there's lots of sounds going on around us at all times. And they're going to interact or interfere to produce one larger sound or quieter. So we would say that this kind of sound is analog. right? If we have a wave. You know, that can be described by some equation that's like sine something or whatever. Um, but that means it's going to be totally continuous. So that means that for every point on, the, you know, on this axis on the time, we're going to have a corresponding value 
on this curve. So the problem is, is that curve is not zeros and ones. So if we're going to have, if we're going to hope to represent sound on our computer, that we're going to need to go from this analog representation, this continuous wave, to something that is just zeros and ones. And the way we're going to do that is with something called sampling. So basically what this says is, even though I have a continuous wave, I'm just going to pick some parts of the wave and write down what that value is. So maybe every half second I'm going to say, what's the value of my sound now? What's the value now? What's the value now? So if I keep doing that, I'm basically going to get something that looks like this. So each of these bars here represents a single sample. So rather than remembering every single point between 0 and 1, I'm just going to remember this one here and say at this time step I had a value of, let's say, 9, whatever that means. So I can keep doing this. And you can see that the, these bars here kind of trace out the shape of my wave. You know, if I were to kind of connect the dots on the bars, you know, I'd kind of get something that looks pretty close to this wave. And again, the reason we need to do this is because our computers can't store this infinite number of values. Right? If this wave keeps going on forever, or even if I just look at you know, the interval between 0 and 1, there's an infinite number of points just in that one interval. So my computer can't store that. We need something that's just zeros and 1s. So by basically looking at the values on this curve and getting some numbers, that means I can take this analog continuous thing and convert it to something that's digital, or zeros and 1s. So the sampling rate, then, is basically how many samples I'm going to take. And so this is very similar to an image resolution. Right? A resolution described how many boxes do we get to work with when we're drawing our image. The sampling rate says how many bars are we going to draw inside of the wave. So we can see here that this one here is a lower sampling rate. It's kind of hard to see here, but we're taking fewer samples, so we have fewer bars to work with. And the result is a shape that kind of resembles the curve a little bit less. If we increase the number of samples, kind of ask the curve, what's your value at this point? What's your value at this point? If we do that more over this same interval, then we get something that looks a lot more like the original curve. So in this previous one, uh, so in this curve here, we took about 30 samples or so. At 30 different points on this curve here, we wrote down what the value was. So does anyone happen to know what the sampling rate on CD quality audio is? Any guesses? How many samples do you think we take every second? 128. Other guesses? How many, how many times, how many samples do we take in one second for a CD? So no other guesses? So the answer is actually about 44,000. So for every second of audio, we're writing down 44,000 different values that occur inside of that second. So related to the sampling rate, then, is the bit rate. And this is kind of the same thing as the color depth. So here, you know, before, we, we wrote down that you know, we have 90% red. And we said, well, what is that 90% of? With the bit rate, we're saying, what number means loud? Right? Is 10 loud? Is a million loud? You know, what's the range of values that each sample can take on? So if we have a higher bit rate, then, that means we're using more bits to represent each sample. And that means, again, we can kind of have more, preci uh, more precision. We can have more information that we can represent. right? Because you know, just like we could use a wider array of colors, we can now have a wider array of sounds, because we have more precise intervals that we can look at. So any guesses as to the bit rate of CDs? How many bits is each sample? Five thousand. Any other guesses? So the bit rate for a CD is actually about sixteen. So that means that the range of values you can take on is from zero to two to the sixteen, which is a pretty big, or two to the sixteen minus one, uh, which is actually a, a pretty big number. Uh, we can also see twenty-four bit audio in kind of more professional settings, um, but that is now the bit rate and the sampling rate of CD quality audio. So now that we have a bit rate and a sampling rate we can actually calculate how big our sound file is going to be. Right? So if we have 44,000, uh, technically 44,100 samples for every second, and we need to actually sample twice, one for, the left, uh, one for your left ear, one for your right ear, 
So we're actually taking more like 88,000 sample, uh, 88, samples per second. And each of those samples then is 16 bits long. So for each second of audio, you're probably looking at about 0.2 megabytes. So for a three minute song, you're starting to push about 30 or 40 megabytes just for a single song. And the reason for that is because we're taking so many samples, and each one of those samples is so large that you know, everything just kind of starts to add up. So the point of other audio formats then, like MP3, is to cut that down to size. Right? If, you're, if every song on your iPod took up 30 megabytes of space, you're going to be able to store an entire order of magnitude fewer songs. Right? We can actually multiply by 10 the number of songs that you can store if we take that 30 and we cut it down to 3. And so that's the goal of MP3, is to basically compress all of that data. And so by the way, um, that CD quality audio it happens to be called PCM. Um, so if, you're, if you ever see that acronym, uh, that's what that means. But the way that MP3 is going to cut down the amount, of, the amount of data in each file is with this really fancy thing called psychoacoustics, which is just a crazy combination of two words. But what this is going to be is it's not some kind of fancy algorithm. It's actually going to take advantage of some limitations in our hearing. So for example, the human ear is not capable of hearing every sound possible. It's actually only capable of hearing frequencies from about 20, to 20 hertz to about 16 kilohertz. You know, 20 kilohertz if you're kind of younger and have fresher ears. So then if I have some PCM audio file and a bunch of those samples are values that are outside of that range, you know, 21 kilohertz or so, if I can't ever hear them anyway, then there's really no point in saving them. And so this is something that the MP3 can do. It can say, oh, here's a frequency that's just too high for a human. I'm going to throw that away. So similarly, uh, we also have something called frequency masking. And this, this, the idea of masking is that if I have two sounds that occur at the same time, in some cases I'm only going to hear one of them. So for example, if I have a really loud sound and I play it at the exact same time as a really quiet sound, then I'm only going to hear the loud one, just because it kind of overpowers the small sound. So if I'm an MP3 and I see a loud sound and a, a, a quiet sound at the same time, and there's really no point in saving that smaller one, since I'm not going to hear it anyway. So similarly, the, the same kind of thing happens with frequencies. If we have two similar frequencies at the same time, we're only going to hear the higher one. So that, again, the MP3 can just kind of throw that away. And so that's kind of at a high level how the MP3 format is going to compress down that 30 megabytes of CD quality audio into a much more reasonable 3 megabyte song or so. And so to do that, uh, it's going to have these two different tools. The first of these tools is called the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT. You don't have to worry about how this works, but it's just kind of this mathematical black box that a computer can figure out, well, where is masking going to occur? What sounds am I allowed to just remove? And this other tool that we have is this thing called a spectrogram. And a spectrogram is kind of a visual representation of what a song looks like. So this, for example, is a spectrogram of a sound file. What's happening here is along the x-axis, we have some time. On the y-axis, we have frequency. And then the intensity of the light is basically the intensity of that frequency. So again, this is just a tool the MP3 compression uses in order to figure out kind of what's going on, what's the best way to distribute these bits to encode the information on a file. So a few bands actually take advantage of this. So I was going to put this in the slideshow in the recap, but every time I see it, it gives me nightmares. So you won't find this anywhere else but the video. Um, but there are some bands that will actually encode images into the spectrograms of their files. So if you open up a program and you actually you know, run this analysis on their song, you get an image. And that could look something like that. So this is a spectrogram of an actual uh, song. And it looks super crazy. And what's going on at this point in the song is like this crazy dubstep thing with like lots of screeching and you know, kind of what you might expect for a spectrogram that looks like this. Uh, but again, this is just kind of one way of looking and analyzing at it kind of visually what an audio file looks like. So that's just kind of a fun aside of some of the tools the MP3 uses in order to compress your file. So now on to what an MP3 file actually looks like. So an MP3 file is divided up into individual frames. So each frame is kind of like a single image. We're going to represent exactly what's going on at this point in time. 
So frames then probably last fractions of a second. And inside of this frame is where we're going to start to write down what we got when we sampled the audio at that point. So we got some frequencies, we got some amplitude, we got something that describes that wave. And so here, that's where we're actually going to write that down. So at the beginning or the end of your MP3 file, we also have some extra space for something called an ID3 tag. Has anyone ever seen this? Or you probably all used one, but have you, does anyone know what this is? So this ID3 is just some metadata associated with the MP3. So more so than images, with your MP3s, you want to know the artist, the album, the year, the album art, and all of this information. So basically, MP3 allows you to define that right inside of the MP3 file. And again, we just have this format called ID3 through which we're going to put some metadata into the MP3 file. So usually this occurs after all of the audio data, but it allows you to, when you browse your songs in iTunes, have multiple columns of data and not just a file name. So really, just for organizational purposes, uh, metadata is super handy uh, with sound files. So what are some common formats for audio? So we just saw MP3 and PCM, but what are some other ones that you might have used? Yeah, so wave. So what's that? Can, kind of an example of a wave. Like, when would you see a wave file? Yeah, so, so WAVE is, is technically uh, like your little system dings and little beeps that occur in your system, those tiny little sounds. Those are typically WAVE files. So WAVE was originally developed by Windows. Um, WAVE is also sometimes used for um, uncompressed data. So WAVE is not it can be uncompressed. And so this could be one way of storing you know, PCM audio with, you know, that isn't super compressed. Any other formats you might have heard of? Yeah, so MPEG is kind of the body that governs MP3 and MP4. It's kind of this broader set of standards. But yeah, so that's definitely uh, a format that's associated with audio. Did you say MP4? Yeah, so MP4 is actually video, video. which we'll see next. But it's kind of the same group that developed uh, this, this body of standards. Any other audio formats? We've seen WAV, MP3. So the default on iTunes is this thing called AAC, uh, which might be file extension is usually M4A or something like that. And this is kind of developed as the next generation to MP3. Um, Apple developed it, and it turns out that since Apple's iPods and iTunes caught on, this thing kind of caught on. Um, MIDI is another one that's typically associated with instruments. You know, if you've ever plugged in a digital piano, you might have seen something about a MIDI input or something like that. Uh, we saw MP3 and WAV, and we also have WMA which is kind of like Microsoft's version of AAC. They wanted to develop their own audio format, and they put it on the Zune, and we all know how well that did. Um, and so, but that exists as well. Um, so as we just said, Audacity is this really cool program uh, that you can use to manipulate sound files. And in the section videos this week, all three of them are going to be focused on kind of manipulating your own multimedia. So how to make graphics with Photoshop, how to use Audacity and GarageBand to remix songs or create your own. Uh, and then finally, how to use iMovie to create your own videos. And so there's just a plug for the section videos this week are super, super cool. Um, they're going to get you off, uh, off your feet and running if you want to start doing your own graphic design or multimedia manipulation, uh, which you'll also be doing in the problem set. So now let's take an aside and talk about 3D graphics now. Actually, before we do, is there any questions on the basics of sound and how MP3 files compress this huge amount of data? OK, so on to 3D graphics, uh, which is something that I work a lot with and I think is really, really cool. So we saw before that we can basically represent 2D graphics by making this grid of stuff and coloring every square inside of that grid. 3D graphics doesn't really work that way. It's kind of impractical to make this huge 3D grid just because it's going to get really, really big. So if we want to represent an object in 3D, we're instead going to use something called a wireframe. You may have seen this before in video games or movies. But a wireframe is basically this bare bones version of an object. It basically just defines the edges of the object. And then we kind of say, here are some important points, and here are how these points are connected. And we get something that looks something like this. So here we have this complicated 3D graphic here, this panda thing. And now we've created a wireframe around it. You see this wireframe, we have a number of little points here. 
basically making a grid over this thing. And this, this wireframe just defines the shape of this object, the edges of this object. We're not worried about things like color or anything like that yet. So a specific type of wireframe is called a mesh. And the difference here is that you can see on this wireframe, you know, we have some curves around the panda. With a mesh, uh, we're not allowed to use any curves. We're only going to use polygons. So they're usually triangles. Sometimes you'll see quadrilaterals or other kind of simple polygon shapes, um, but no curves. And this is a really common way to actually represent 3D objects when you're working with you know, creating a 3D game or a 3D movie or something like that. So a polygon mesh uh, looks something like this. So here's a mesh that represents dolphin. We can see here that there's really no detail to the 3D dolphin yet. All this mesh is doing is it's defining the shape of the dolphin. And every single one of these little polygons is a triangle. So we can create these, shape, uh, these quadrilaterals then, or quads, by simply kind of putting two triangles right next to each other. So that means that you know, by kind of arranging these polygons, we can go from simple 2D shapes to this nice three-dimensional shape. So any questions on how we're kind of representing the shape of 3D images? OK. So the problem here is that we're going to need a whole lot of polygons if we want to start defining smooth curves. So we saw before when we looked at the low resolution Vimeo logo that it was kind of hard to make a curve when we didn't have that many pixels to work with. So we're going to run into the same problem here with 3D. If we're only allowed to draw lines and we need to somehow make a curve, we're going to need a lot of really, really small lines in order to get a curve. But one way we can kind of get around this is with this thing called subdivision. And what subdivision is, it's basically a process from going from a mesh that looks like this, kind of, this is a little nicer because you can kind of see curves, but it's still kind of, you know, jerky, to something that's really, really smooth, but without needing to define, you know, tens of thousands of polygons to get the curve. Uh, so this is best explained with a demo. So here we go. So I'm on a site here, and this is a mesh for a diamond ring. So you can see here that if I click this wireframe button, then this is my wireframe. You know, I'm just kind of loosely defining the edges of this ring. Now, if I uncheck this box, all I'm doing is I'm coloring basically all of the area inside of this box, all the area inside of that little trapezoid there. And so I get something that looks like this. But the problem is, is that this looks absolutely nothing like a diamond ring. Right? We want to get curves. We don't want to actually, you know, get these straight lines. So we want to go from this shape to something that's more curved. So the process by which we can do that looks something like this. So let's say up on the top left here, we have a mesh. And it's not that curved. We just have these, these four squares. and They're just kind of flat and angular. And we want to start making them a little more curved. So the way we can do that is by basically creating some new points. So if we just focus on this face here, right? It has, we did basically have a square with four corners. Now what we're going to do is we're going to divide this one square with four corners into four squares that are a fourth of the size. So if we look from A to B, if you focus on this face here, you can see that right here, that one square has become four. And the way we did that was we said, OK, let's stick a point right in the middle of that face. And now let's create edges that go from this point to the edges that already existed on the mesh. Right? So this line here is pretty much exactly the same. We haven't moved it around or anything. All we've done is we've taken this new point here, split up this one face into four faces, and suddenly they're a little bit smaller, which means that we can make it look a little smoother. So when we go from B to C, we're doing the exact same thing. Each of these smaller faces now gets chopped up again. We put a little point in the middle, and we basically take this square and we split it up into fours. And if we keep doing that, we can see with only kind of three runs of this, we run from something that looks really slanty and, and jagged to a nice curved surface down in the bottom right corner with D. So any questions on kind of how this process works? Just kind of splitting up faces into smaller ones, which allows us to make smoother curves. So let's see what happens when we do this to the diamond ring. So I'm going to click this button here that says Increase Subdivision. And what this is going to do is it's going to do that, that exactly that process we just saw. For every face, we're just going to kind of cut it up into smaller ones and connect it to things that already existed. So if I click this once, we go from this to this. And so that's not bad. It looks more like a diamond ring. So I'm going to click it again. 
and once more. Now suddenly, with this same mesh, we have something that's much, much smoother and looks much more like a diamond ring. But remember, I didn't actually save the locations of all of these polygons. So if I click on wireframe, we can barely even see the individual polygons because there are so many of them. But again, these are just all straight lines. There are no, no curves or anything. But if I hit decrease subdivision again, this is where we started. So that means if I want to download this mesh and I want to use this ring in my video game, I don't need to download a mesh that is really, really huge and defines all of these different polygons. Instead, I can just download this simple mesh, and then depending on how detailed I want to make my video game or my 3D world, I can divide it even more times or even fewer times. So if I want a really detailed video game, I can keep increasing the subdivision, which of course takes some time, so you need a faster processor. Or if I want a not so detailed game, then I just don't subdivide it as many times, and I get something that looks like this. So the goal here was really to take some really simple mesh that doesn't define anything like curvature and make a really smooth surface just by kind of cutting things in half and dividing up every single one of its faces. So any questions on this process? OK, so this is how we can represent a single object. But how can we represent now an entire world? Well, a scene then is really just composed of these individual objects. So this is a super simple 3D scene. I just have these two cubes. So each of these cubes here is itself a mesh. We've defined some triangles that make up the faces of these cubes, and we just kind of colored over them with the crayon. So now, let's actually jump to this. I shall zoom in. So here's my 3D world. Let me move it over. So now, to create this, after I've loaded these meshes, I just want to define where in the world these things are. So I basically have this big coordinate system where the center could be 0, or really I can put the 0 wherever I want it. I'm going to say this cube here is a little bit to the left of 0. It's a little bit you know, above the ground. And this cube here is a little bit to the right of 0, and so on. So because I'm just remembering where these things are in space, it means that I can really easily do something like this. Now here, all I've done was I've changed my perspective. But the positions of these cubes didn't change at all. And so this is kind of the, what goes into creating 3D games and 3D graphics. We're going to define meshes for these objects. We're going to define positions for those meshes in the world. And then we're just going to say, well, I'm going to put my camera somewhere and figure out the angles that these things should be displayed at. So there are a couple optimizations we can make to this. So let's say that instead of that perspective, I have something like this. So right now, the only thing in my view is this 2D cube. Because remember, even though the scene is 3D, I can only look at it. When I look at it, I kind of have a two-dimensional picture of the thing. So that means that if I know I'm only looking at the blue cube, it's kind of pointless for me to do two things. One, it's totally pointless for me to try to draw the red cube, because I can't see it at all. So this process is called clipping. So we don't want to draw anything that we know we can't view. The other thing that would be pointless would be to draw the back of this cube. Right? I'm looking at the front of it, and there's no way I can see through it and kind of around it. So there's no reason for me to draw those polygons either. And so this process is called culling. We want to say that if something is out of view, it's obstructed by another object, or I just can't see it from my perspective, then there's no need to draw it. You know, your CPU is going to kind of waste time trying to draw it, which isn't the best thing in the world. So any questions on that really simple 3D graphics primer? OK, just kind of a fun aside of you know, how we can take these things in 2D and, and blow them up into 3D. So now let's talk about video. So we've seen graphics. We've seen how we can represent still images. We've seen how we can represent audio. So now let's put the two things together into a video. So a video now has two parts, a codec and a container. So you may have seen something like codecs if you've been Googling around for a file you, you downloaded and you can't play or something like that. But a codec is essentially a little program that's responsible for compressing and decompressing a video. So with, you know, with audio, we had like a 30 megabyte sound file, and that was kind of the end of the world. With a video, we have huge files that are totally unrealistic uh, to distribute. You know, something in the order of hundreds of gigabytes for just a one hour movie. That's just not something that you could put on a DVD or a Blu-ray disc. So it's really important that we can somehow compress this video. And the role of the codec is to do exactly that. 
So anyone happen to know of any common video codecs? Different ways of encoding, an uh, encoding a video and compressing it down? Yeah, so .mov is actually going to be a container, which, is, which we'll see in just a sec. So codecs are a little bit uh, less common, but the most common one here is called H.264, which again is just some standard that's kind of used by everything now. Um, but there do exist some other ones uh, that might be, you might find on um, videos online. Um, but H.264 is a codec, and it's basically a way of compressing a video. So a container, on the other hand, is what's going to kind of package up a video. So a video has an audio track, it has a video track, might also have something like a DVD menu or captions, and the video container is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to kind of capture all of that together. So we just saw that uh, one common container is MOV. Any other ones you might have heard of? So these are typically like video files. So what, what are some video files end in? So VLC is actually a player uh, for uh, video files, they, but they've also developed some codecs uh, as well. Yeah, so AVI is one. So that's usually um, more common on Windows and they're put up by a company called DivX. Uh, some other ones that you know, we use ourselves, MP4, uh, which is, again, just a container, uh, MOV, MKV, WebM. These are all just different containers for videos. So the idea of containers and codecs are separate. So a codec is what's used to actually take this big video and compress it, and a container will contain that codec. So each of these different containers has different support for different codecs. In the real world, you know, H.264 is just kind of this universal standard now. Um, but in addition to this video codec, you might also have an audio track associated with it. You might have an audio codec, and those are kind of the formats that we looked at before. So the job of this container, then, is to kind of combine video and audio and subtitles into a file format that we can actually distribute and that isn't hundreds of gigabytes large. So any questions on the vocabulary there, codecs versus containers? Yeah? Which, which one determines whether like, the uh, video plays in HD or has HD audio and whatnot? Yeah, so what determines if the video has HD audio and stuff? So that would be something like the codec, because, or you know, basically the resolution of the video, which we'll see in just a sec. Um, determines what the video looks like. The container is just really using the data from the codec to give you something that I can watch. So again, we need to talk about compression so we can get those huge files into manageable ones. So the compression happens by the codec. So that means it's kind of the codec's decision how to compress the data. But let's just look really quickly at kind of the, the high level information here. So let's look first at this bottom picture here. So we have a scene. Uh, divided into three frames. So here we just kind of have a chair sitting there. The chair doesn't move, the ground doesn't move. And then in the last frame here, you know, we just have some movement, whatever that is, over to the right side. So the basic idea behind compressing this video is just like the idea we had when compressing images. There's no need to store this redundant data. Right? The chair isn't moving at all. So why do we need to keep storing the information for the chair if it's staying the same? So this top image here, is what would actually be saved, maybe, inside of your video file. So we, there's no need to store any information over here, because it's exactly the same as it was in the previous frame. We only need to worry about kind of this new information that's coming in from the right. And so this is just kind of a high-level high level overview of what it means to compress a video. So is this kind of technique make sense? Any questions on what happened here? Yeah. Yeah, so how are these things stored? Yeah, it's exactly like that. We're going to define frames. And each of these frames could have like this frame over here, all the information, or could have some of the information. But effectively, yeah, we're going to need to represent some, the still image in a frame in kind of exactly the same way. There's also another standard called MJPEG, which is motion JPEG, which is basically saying that we're going to define a movie by kind of a series of JPEG images. And so that's exactly what happens. We have these individual frames, and we can compress these frames to get one big sequence or a movie. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, so just like we had before, we, we can have both lossy and lossless compression. So this one happens to be lossless because we're not losing any information. We're just kind of not redundantly storing it. But yeah, so different codecs might choose lossy or a combination of lossless and lossy you know, at, at different points in the video. Um, but we won't get too much into that. Um, but yeah, so that's up to the codec to decide how that's going to happen exactly. OK, so let's skip this because I want to talk about something awesome. So really quickly, uh, the resolution of a video then is just like the resolution of an image. It's going to define how much information is actually in the video. So what are some common video resolutions? You may have, you may have seen these actually in the little drop down on the lectures page. If you ever watch a lecture online, there are some resolutions there in that drop down menu. Does anyone remember any? Yeah, 720p. Any other ones? Yeah, so 1080p, so that's like super high def. So there's also 480p, which is lower. And basically, the idea of video resolution is exactly the same. This is going to be how many pixels, or, or called scan lines now in a video, how many pixels wide and tall is the video. So that means that with my HD video, there, there's a lot more detail, because I have more room to capture information. It also means that there's going to be a larger file. So if you want to watch a lecture in a lower quality, you can kind of click on 480p. You notice that it's you know, not as high quality, but it's going to download a lot faster uh, because it's such a smaller file. Whereas if you go to 1080p, you'll get much more detail, but it might take you a little longer to actually get uh, to download the file. So if you're on a slow internet connection, you might see that buffering message every so often. So the aspect ratio then is related to the resolution. Does anyone know what the aspect ratio, what that means? Kind of what it sounds like? Yeah, exactly. So it's the ratio of width to height. And so a really common widescreen aspect ratio is 16 by 9. So when we say 1080p and 720p and we're looking at um, those resolutions, the aspect ratio for all of those is 16 by 9. So that means even though we just say 1080p, because we know the aspect ratio, we can say, OK, well, that means that if I have a height of 1080, that means my width must be 1920. Because that's the number I need in order to get that aspect ratio. So that's why we can get away by just saying 1080p. That 1080 is just the height, and then we can infer what the width is because we're just using the same aspect ratio for everything. So another common aspect ratio is 4 by 3, and that's kind of for lower resolutions or, or smaller screen sizes back in the day. So uh, something we don't do on the lectures page, but something that you know, YouTube or Hulu or Netflix does do, is this thing called adaptive bitrate streaming. And all this says is that it's going to, rather than asking you to pick 1080 or 480, it's going to say, OK, I'm just going to pick it for you based on your internet connection. So if you have a fast connection and you have no problem downloading the 1080p version, I'm going to give it to you. But if you're on kind of a slower internet connection, if you have the choice between a high quality movie and a movie, you're probably going to pick the one that you can actually watch. And so Netflix can you know, dynamically, on the fly, change you from a 1080p version to a 480p version if it notices you're buffering or that you can't keep up, keep up with the downloads. So that's just a cool technology, and that's, that's kind of what that means. Uh, so something that's really awesome are these things called GPUs. So we talked a little bit uh, about, the graphics, about the graphics card in your computer back when we talked about motherboards. But we didn't really say you know, what that did, other than it draws stuff. So one component of your video card is this thing called the GPU, or graphics processing unit. And the graphics processing unit is, uh, is a really, really powerful piece of hardware that you know, just kind of right now we're starting to really take advantage of. So the idea behind a GPU is that rather than you know, performing one computation, we're going to start using parallelism. When I say parallelism, I don't mean that we're going to have four people counting candy at once. I mean we're going to have 10,000 people counting candy at once. And this becomes really, really powerful in a lot of graphics applications. right? Because if your screen has a bunch of pixels, we need to figure out what's at each of these pixels. If we figure out 10,000 of those pixels at once, that's great. And it's also totally workable, because a pixel over here doesn't depend on a pixel over here. Right? These are all totally independent problems. And so this is what your GPU actually does. It can run all of these computations at the same time. And we mean a lot of computations at the same time. So this is what a GPU looks like. And it looks like super badass, because it is. It has its own fan. It's got its own everything. It's so cool. Um, so here is uh, by far the best explanation of a GPU that I've seen. So this is by the Mythbusters uh, at some conference for NVIDIA, which is just a manufacturer uh, for GPUs. 
And unfortunately, they don't, as Mythbusters tend to do, they don't really explain what they're doing. They just kind of blow stuff up. So what's happening here is we're going to illustrate two things. They're going to have a painting. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to paint something with the CPU. So kind of doing one thing at a time. And then they're going to create a painting with a GPU, where rather than having one process at a time, they're going to do a whole bunch of stuff all at once. But each of those individual stuffs is going to be really small, and it's also going to be totally independent of all of the other things. So here we go. Leonardo. All right, I introduced you, Leonardo. And he's going to paint a picture for you guys in the way that a CPU might do it, as a series of discrete actions performed sequentially, one after the other. In three, two, one. Uh, let me speed it up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Leonardo. When we hit this trigger on this thing, 2,100 gallons of air goes through these accumulators, out these valves, into all 1,100 of these tubes, into these tubes in which the bottom of is a paintball. Each of those paintballs will fly across seven feet of space and in 80 milliseconds reach its target. Hopefully, when it's all said and done, it's going to paint the Mona Lisa. GPU <laughs> painting demonstration yep. in 10. Nine, Nine, eight, eight seven, six, six, five, four, four three, <laughs> two, one. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, science class is now over. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that's the basic idea behind a GPU, a big, huge paintball gun with a bunch of cylinders. So what we just did there is we had this, we took this one small thing. What color is this pixel? And we solved a bunch of those problems all at once. So the result is these really huge performance gains. So you know, if something on your CPU looks like this, you know, it's, it's super jittery and super boring. If you do the same exact thing on the GPU, it starts being screaming fast. And so this is just a really, really cool uh, piece of hardware that we're starting to use now for not just graphics, but you know, scientific computing and these other really hard problems. So before we go, uh, one more super cool algorithm. Everything we do now is super cool. So we saw before that we, if we wanted to take this raster graphic, we wanted to make it bigger, kind of our solution was to, OK, let's like vector graphic or something like that, or just deal with the lower resolution. So now let's take the opposite problem. Let's say we have this really big image here, and we want to make it smaller. So by the way, does anyone recognize what this is from? Yes. Automatic A if you do. You gotta tell me. You can't just, I can't just believe you. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is from Wind Waker, uh, which is an awesome video game. Okay. So let's say we have this huge image. It's kind of a widescreen image, and we want to cut it down. So if we just you know go into Photoshop and hit scale, we're gonna get something that looks like this. And frankly, this looks a little stupid, right? Everything is deformed. You know, our, our character here is really skinny. This thing over here is not the right shape, and that you know that didn't really work out so well. But let's let's be a little smart about this. Over to the left of this image here there's a lot of nothing, right? There's really nothing over here that is important to the scene. Like we have this little island over here, but between you know, Link over here and the island over here, there's just a lot of empty space. So rather than kind of scaling everything universally, let's just cut out that empty space to get a smaller image. So we have a nice program here that will do just that. So here's my image. And the way that I'm going to figure out what parts I can crop out without kind of damaging the point of the whole image, is I'm going to compute a value for each of these pixels. And I'm going to call this my energy. And a pixel's energy is basically how different it is from the pixels around it. So if we zoom in a little bit, let's say on this shield. So we can see here that you know, with this reflection and the little graphic, that each of these pixels is pretty different than all of the ones around it. So there's kind of a lot of energy going on here. There's a lot of stuff that's changing. So this is probably pretty important to the image, if there's a lot of stuff going on. If, on the other hand, we come over here, you know, we just look at this blotch of ocean, every pixel is just kind of the same. So there's really not a whole lot going on inside of this, this part of the picture. So here's what the energy uh, for this looks like. What? So it's super cool. So here, all of the white areas are areas with really high energy. 
So you can see here, there's a lot going on over here at this tower. There's a lot going on here. But over here, we see there's really not that much going on. It's just kind of this black area. So that means that we can cut it out. So if we come back to our original image, I'm going to come down here to the bottom right. And rather than you know width of 960, I'm going to say I want a width of 800. And I click on Resize. We get something that's much, much nicer. So notice how you know, the character now is the same width as he was before. But if you kind of compare them side by side, suddenly these two clouds, these two clouds here, are a lot closer together. And that's because we effectively cut out that part of the image rather than just scaling everything uniformly. And so when we compare them side by side, we've basically gone from something like this to something like this. Notice there's a really big difference in the quality of these two images, even though they're exactly the same size. So we can try another one. So here is perhaps a more identifiable video game. So this is the first level of Mario. And again, we want to scale this. And if we just kind of you know, push the two sides closer together, suddenly Mario is going to get a lot smushed, and it's just going to look silly. But there's really nothing going on in here, so we can just cut it out. So if I change this 900 to 800, click on Resize, you know, we get a pretty nice result. We ended up cutting some stuff over here, and we cut some stuff over here. But this is just much nicer than kind of uniformly smushing the image together. And so this, this technique for rescaling images uh, is called seam carving. It's also available um, in like Photoshop and GIMP, or you know, we can, this program here is free available to download. Um, so you might also see it uh, called content aware scaling, because it's kind of aware of what content it's scaling, rather than just kind of smushing everything universally. And so I thought this was just a really, really cool graphics application to see that we can get you know, from this wide image to this much smaller one you know, by being kind of smart about how we compress it. So this also works, by the way, to expand the image. So if I, rather than making it 960, I want to make it something like 1060, and I hit resize. Notice here, we just kind of added some ocean, and we added some of this cloud cover. And actually, that, you know, that looks pretty good. It doesn't look like we really manipulated anything all too much. And all we did there is we kind of were smart about, rather than removing pixels, we were smart about duplicating pixels. So it's kind of hard to see the seam that, you know, where we duplicated along, but now this image is even wider than it was before. So one last one to end on, uh, to show that this also works vertically. Anyone identify that? Star Fox, my all-time favorite. So now, rather than saying, you know, we want a smaller width, notice here we have a whole lot of literally nothing, because we're in outer space, uh, going on at the bottom there. So if we change 450 to something like 300, we click Resize, all of the R wings and the great fox retain the original shape. We've just kind of cut out the bottom there because we were smart about how we were rescaling the image. So this is just a, a technique that I think is really, really cool uh, and totally random. Something we can do once we have this representation of multimedia. So any questions on that? All right. So to end, this problem set is going to ask you uh, to create some multimedia of your own. Basically, you know, anything you want, something about I survived E1 or something about CS E1, some meme or something you enjoyed. And we can take that graphic that you make and we can put it on whatever we want. We can put it on a t-shirt, you can put it on a mug, you can put it on the dog with the towel or whatever. And so basically, once you submit uh, your graphic, you'll actually be able to buy uh, your graphic or your classmates' graphics. You can have a little souvenir uh, from the course. So that's something to look forward to in problem set five. Uh, if you haven't used anything like Photoshop or GIMP before, uh, definitely start off with these section videos. They're a great place to start. And the problem stuff itself will also have some cool tutorials to get you started. Uh, and if not, if there are any questions, I will hang around after lecture. Uh, but if not, then good luck creating your awesome custom stationery. <laughs>